so this weekend, I want to shift gears a little bit, and I'm going to address, I, I think it's a simple but profound question, is this, is the Bible true? Is the Bible accurate? Is the Bible reliable? Let's think of it another way. Is the Bible really God's word to us? Is it, Or is it just a great bunch of stories, some inspirational things? Because here's the thing, if it's not God's word to us, then at the end of the day, the Bible is really no better than a Confucius quote or a Buddha blessing. Like, I don't know if you've ever read the Koran. I don't know if you've ever taken the time to read the Book of Mormon. You probably haven't. There's some really good stuff in the Book of Mormon. There's some really good things about relationships in the Book of Koran. It's, it's, there's great advice, but here's the thing. If that's the case, if it says good things about loving your neighbor and taking care of one another and living a good life, what makes the Bible any different than the Book of Koran or the Book of Mormon? So what I want to talk about is I want to begin by giving you three ways that the Bible is unique. And these are just some facts about the Bible that maybe you need to, you didn't know. But first of all, the Bible is unique because of its circulation. I don't know it if you know it or not, but the Bible is the most published book of all time. Over 7 billion copies of the Bible are in print. Now, let me just give you a little bit of perspective. The Book of Mormon, there's less than 200 million copies, million with an M in print. Uh, even the Koran, only about 800 million. But when we talk about the Bible, 7 billion copies of the Bible in print. Almost 2,800 copies of the Bible are sold around the world every minute of every day. So understand the Bible is unique in its circulation. Here's the second thing. The Bible is unique in its translation. The Bible has been translated into over 1,200 languages. Again, to give you some perspective, the Koran has been translated into 114 languages. Uh, the Book of Mormon only into 80 languages. But the Bible has been translated to 1,200 different languages. It's still being translated. It's the most translated book of all time. But this is what I want you to also understand. The Bible is incredibly unique in its preservation. I mean, when you think about it, the Bible has been picked apart, it's been ridiculed, it's been banned, it's been burned, it's constantly under attack, you name it, the Bible has gone through it, but it seems that the Bible always emerges out the other side stronger than ever. My point is simply this, whatever you believe about the Bible, the Bible is unique. But before we get into the book of Genesis next week, and, and, and you know, I was going to jump right in, but I thought, man, I'm not really sure because we're getting into some controversial stuff in the very first week when we get an overview of the book of Genesis. I want to address something that I think is much more important, and it's this. Is the Bible accurate? Is it reliable? Is it true? Because I think we could probably all agree that it's unique, but if it's not accurate, if it's not true, if it's not reliable, then what good is it? So how can we know when we open the Word of God, how can we know that we are reading the exact Bible that God intended for us to have? I mean, if someone at work asked you, how do you know that it hasn't changed over the years? How do you know that men haven't changed? How do we know that we're actually reading the word of God in the form that God intended for us to read? And how do we know that it's true? So I want to talk about that. Here's the first thing I want to address. I want you to understand the Bible is accurate in its documentation. I'm going to give you an example. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of Plato? Not Plato, okay, we've heard of that, but Plato. We've all heard of Plato, right? How many of you, maybe in college, how many of you have read the complete works of Plato? Raise your hand. Anybody read the cliff notes of Plato? Well, this is what's interesting. None of us have ever read it. But we will go to college, we'll sit in a university, and we will hear a professor talk about Plato, and none of us question the historicity or the authenticity of Plato. We just take it at face value. We just assume that what we're having to study in college is what Plato originally wrote in 300 BC. But I want you to think about this. There are actually, if you do the research and you can Google this yourself, there are actually zero ancient copies of the writings of Plato. But nobody ever questions that. In fact, Plato lived around 300 BC. Around 300 AD, which was six centuries later, we have a few fragments, not even of the original documents. We have a few fragments of some copies that were made. And we can listen to those things and read those things, and they can be presented as if they are a fact. Nobody questions it. Now, this is what's interesting. There are over 14,000 
ancient copies of the New Testament. Zero of Plato, nobody questions it. Over 14,000 copies of the ancient text of the New Testament alone. And people try to pick it apart and people try to discredit it, but I want you to know the Bible is the most reliable piece of literature in the history of the world. For example, did you know that there are 181,253 words in the New Testament? How many of you knew that? See, I can tell Rick's thinking, I'm going to go home and count those things this afternoon. 181,253 words in the New Testament. Of those 181,253 words, only 400 words have ever been questioned by scholars, historians, and linguistic experts. And even those 400 words have to do with misspelled words and grammatical errors. So almost 181,000 words, the rest of those words, are exactly what they were intended to be. They're exactly what was in the original ancient documents. They are right on target. So I want you to understand something. When we read the Bible, we have every reason to be confident that we have the exact same Bible today that has always existed. In fact, it's supernatural how God has taken the time and the energy to preserve the Bible. And so understand it's unique in its documentation. This is what the writer of Psalm David says in Psalm 19, verse 7. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect. And this word Hebrew in the perfect doesn't mean perfect like you have perfect hair or you have perfect teeth. Literally, it means accurate. And so literally what it says is this, the law of the Lord is accurate, refreshing the soul. The statues of the Lord are trustworthy. In other words, the Bible is reliable. David says you can trust it. And I know what some of you are thinking because this is where we get the hang up. Mike, what about the miracles? Because when I try to defend my faith, it's the miracles that I have a hard time. I have a hard time really trying to explain to people that I believe that a guy was swallowed by a fish and three days later was vomited up on land. Well, I will tell you this. Later on, when I give you an overview of the book of Jonah, I'm going to actually give you some accounts of other people back as late as the 1800s and earlier and then later that were literally swallowed by fish and lived to tell about it. In fact, I will probably tell you the exact fish. It wasn't a well that swallowed Jonah. I'll tell you the fish that did it. But see, we think these are miracles, and yet when you really dig around a little bit, there's, there, there's evidence that this happened to other people. But it's those kinds of things again. Resurrection, people coming back to life. Not just Jesus, but people that Jesus brought back to life healings that took place, uh, the Red Sea parting. Listen, we're going to be in Genesis next week, and in the first seven chapters, we got to deal with creation, and we got to deal with the universal flood. How do we explain those things? And a lot of us have a hard time believing that stuff. Well, again, let's take the classical historical method of studying literature that's used all throughout history, and let's think about the miracles for a second. Understand when the miracles in the Bible were performed, they were performed in public. And when these miracles took place, people began to talk about these, these miracles. People began to record them. I don't know if you've read The Chosen or not, but I think it has done a phenomenal job of depicting what it must have been like in those days when they didn't have internet, they didn't have cable TV, but when they heard through the grapevine the miracles that were taking place under the ministry of Jesus, how the crowds grew and the people came and they would sit all night and listen to him because they heard and people began to record, right? I'll give an example of the details that you find in the Bible because it's the details that make this stuff believable. Uh, if you ever get to go to Israel with me, usually we wrap up our trip on the last day by visiting a tomb that is very, very probable, could have been without it, I'd say about a 98% uh, efficiency that this was the tomb that Jesus was placed in after the crucifixion. Now, let me tell you what's so interesting about this tomb. This tomb is located within about 100 yards. It's probably within about a one or two minute walk from a place that looks just like a skull. Just like a skull. Now, why is that significant? Well, this is significant because this is what it says in John chapter 19, verse 41. At the place where Jesus was crucified, Matthew tells us it was called Gol Golgotha, the place of the skull, there was a garden. Wow. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had been laid because it was the Jewish day of preparation 
And since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now, the reason I share this with you, because in a moment like that, when you're standing outside of a tomb or you're standing inside of a tomb that's within about a one or two minute walk from a place that looks just like a skull, see, it no longer feels like a fairy tale. It no longer feels like some magical story that you heard about in Sunday school. All of a sudden, it, it feels more historical. It feels like an event that actually took place that happened in history, and part of it is because of the details that the Bible gives us. Let me show you another example. Uh, interesting story, Acts chapter 3. It kind of describes what I'm talking about. And as I read through this story, I want you just to listen to the details. In fact, one of the reasons uh, that you can probably believe and take the Bible seriously is because of all of the details that we get in the Bible. Let me show you the story. It's Acts chapter 3, verse 1. It says, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple, a real place, at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate, beautiful, a real place, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And I can promise you this, when the crowd around the temple heard them refer to Jesus of Nazareth, they knew exactly who Peter and John were talking about. And then it says in verse 7, taking him by, look at this detail, the right hand. He helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet. He began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement in what had happened to him. And so when they see this man walking, naturally they don't get it. Naturally they're blown away, and they're asking, what happened? I mean, this is the same guy that has been sitting outside the temple for years. In fact, it tells us in Acts chapter 4, verse 22, over 40 years, over 40 years. And so it says in verse 11, when the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in a place called Solomon's Colony, another detail. It was a place that existed. It was as if Luke the writer was saying, listen, check it out. This stuff really happened. Check it out for yourself. This is real places that you can visit. And then the story continues in verse 5. The next day, the rulers, the elders, the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. And you can Google these names. Real historical people. Annas the high priest was there. Caiaphas was there. John was there. Alexander and other of the high priest's family. Verse 21. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. You can't unring that bell. You can't make that kind of stuff go away. And notice how these guys responded to the threat in verse 33. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, do you know why that statement's so amazing? It's amazing because, as I pointed out before, these are the same guys that hid after the crucifixion because they thought they were going to be the next ones ending up on the cross, right? In fact, these followers went on, and I won't go through all the details, but they went on and died. But I want to point something out. They didn't die for what they believed. We often have people say, would you be willing to die for your beliefs? I want you to understand something. They didn't die for what they believed. They died for what they saw, what they witnessed. They saw, they witnessed firsthand a dead man come back to life. And let me tell you, that's going to get your attention. They witnessed history and they recorded it. Let me give you some other examples to show you just how uh, reliable the uh, historicity of the Bible is. If you've ever read the Old Testament, I'm sure you have, or at least you've heard about them. You've heard about a group called the Hittites. How many of you have ever really studied the Hittites? Probably not most of us. They're right in there with the Hittites, the termites, the, all those lists we, we read, you know, when they went into the, into the promised land. For years, historians and archaeologists said the Hittites never existed. We can't find any evidence they ever lived. We, we can't find any uh, cities. We can't find any clothing. We can't find any writings. We can't find any artifacts. 
the Bible is wrong. 1906, archaeologists are digging around in a tell. And when you go to Israel, you'll see lots of tells. All of a sudden in the middle, you'll see a mound. And a mound is a tell. And that's just one city that has been built on top of another. They begin to dig around in a tell. And guess what? They found the Hittites capital city. Over the next two week period, they uncovered over 40 more Hittite towns. And there were a whole lot of historians and a whole lot of archaeologists with egg on their face who had to say, oh, wow, we were wrong. The Bible was right. For years, they said Jericho was a myth. Jericho never happened. We can't find any evidence that Jericho was ever, this Jericho of the Bible. Now, we know the story of Jericho because they marched around it and the walls fell in. Well, guess what happened? In 1907, some archaeologists were digging around and they found a city that was Jericho. In fact, when I was just there, we had lunch in Jericho one day. If you saw pictures online of people uh, on their Facebook picture riding camels, they were riding camels in the city of Jericho that historians would tell us never existed. Um, Luke chapter 2, uh, there's a leader in Syria by the name of Quirinius. Uh, Quirinius, who lived in the time of Jesus, he was involved in the census. Remember the story? It was Quirinius in Luke chapter 2 that said, everybody has to go back to their hometown where they were born, and they have to register because you have to pay your taxes. But again, historians came along and said the Bible is wrong. Luke was misguided. It didn't happen. We can't find any record ever anywhere of any dude named Quirinius. Years later, an archaeologist is digging around in Antioch of Syria, and he uncovers a stone, and inscribed on the stone, dated 7 B.C., it said, Quirinius of Syria ruled. Over the next few days in Egypt, they uncovered a fragment that explained how Quirinius gave a decree that people had to go back to their hometown to register where they were born in order to pay their taxes. For years, they said Pilate, who condemned Jesus to death, never existed. They couldn't find any record of Pilate, and until 1961, archaeologists were digging around in Caesarea by the sea, and they found an inscription that talked about Pontius Pilate. And once again, the historians had to say, the Bible is correct and we're wrong. And we could go on and on and on. But think about this. There are over 25,000 archaeological discoveries that substantiate and prove just the Old Testament. Just the Old Testament. Uh, Nelson Gluck, he's a famous Jewish archaeologist. He writes this. It may be categorically stated that no archaeological discovery has ever contradicted a biblical reference. Now, let me just put it in perspective. And this is not to, to beat on Mormons, but let me, just, let, 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 let me just compare this to the Book of Mormon. Not one historian has ever found one thread of historical evidence to document even one word, one word in the Book of Mormon. But I'm telling you, the Bible and history in archaeology, they go, they go hand in hand. My point is simply this. You can trust the Bible in its historicity. It's been documented. It's authentic. It's accurate. Now, not only is the Bible accurate in its documentation, and this may be even more important, the Bible is accurate in its inspiration. And when you hear the word inspiration, it's not the word inspiration like, oh, wow, I was inspired to go to the gym yesterday. By the way, I'm never inspired to go to the gym. I, I've never, I'm right. It's not that kind of inspiration. I was inspired to go on a diet. The word inspired in the Greek simply means God breathed. 2 Timothy 3.16, I think the New American Standard says all scripture is inspired by God, but the NIV says all scripture is God breathed. In other words, when these guys who wrote the Bible, they wrote down what God inspired them to write. That's how we got the Bible. And as I said just a few weeks ago, as I introduced this series, you have to understand that the Bible isn't really a book. And this is what makes the Bible so amazing. The Bible is a collection of 66 books. And these 66 books are written by 40 different people over a span of 1,400 years spread across three continents in three different languages. Now, let me just put that in perspective. Let's say that the Bible was completed. The Bible was completed in 2023, for that to happen, that means that it would have been, had to have been started 
in 600 A.D. 600 A.D. That's 300 years before the Dark Ages. That's how long? 1,400 years ago. That's 800 years before Columbus discovered America. The Bible would have started, had to be start writing in 600 A.D. and be completed now. That's exactly what happened. 40 writers over 1,400 years over three different continents. And together, when you read it, and you'll see it as we kick off the series next week with the book of Genesis, the story from the very beginning to the very end holds true. It holds true. It's an epic love story. God created mankind to be in a relationship with mankind. Mankind didn't have to do anything. They were already in the relationship, but they blew it because they sinned. And the rest of the Bible is nothing else but God putting it all back together again. It is an epic love story. And what's interesting about these Bible writers, when you think about it, they didn't come from the same fraternity. They couldn't have come from the same neighborhood. They didn't have Wi-Fi and Internet, so they couldn't compare notes. Think about it. These guys weren't even theologians. In fact, I made a list. Some were military leaders. Some were fishermen. Some were statesmen. Some were tax collectors. Some were kings. Some were uh, prisoners. And yet all these different personalities, they wrote the Bible, and God inspired their personalities in the process. For example, every once in a while, somebody will ask me, Mike, why do we have four Gospels? Doesn't it seem redundant that we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all record the life of Jesus? And I always tell people, we don't have four Gospels. What we have is one Gospel, but we have it from four different perspectives. For example, Matthew, we know Matthew, he was an official of Rome, he was, worked as a tax collector, but eventually he began to follow Jesus. So when he wrote his account of Jesus' life, Matthew wrote his account from the perspective of a Jew because his concern, his number one concern was to communicate to Jews that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. And so you're not surprised to find at the very beginning of the book of Matthew a genealogy. Now, a Gentile couldn't care less about that. But a Jew looking for the Messiah was going to look back to Abraham, and that's exactly where Matthew began. And he traces the roots of Jesus all the way back to Abraham, who's the father of a Jew. Now, Mark comes along, and uh, Mark wasn't a Jew. He was a Roman. Uh, by the way, in Mark's day, the Greeks were the deep thinkers. The Romans, not so much, okay? They were like the party animals. They were interested in events and activities and action. Uh, and, and so you're not surprised, and this is the kind of time I'm willing to put into teaching. The word immediately appears over and over and over and over again. In fact, the word immediately appears 41 times, 41 times in the smallest of the Gospels, the Gospel of Mark. In fact, let me, uh, I, 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 just in chapter one, listen to this. Uh, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth, this is verse 9, in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan, verse 10, and immediately coming out of the water, verse 12, and immediately the Spirit brought him out of the wilderness. Uh, it says down in verse 16, he was going along the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will have you become fishers of people. Verse 18, immediately. Verse 20, immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and went away to follow him. They went to Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed. And then he healed someone and he cast out a demon. So it says in verse 28, immediately the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding region of Galilee. Verse 29, and immediately after they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever. They immediately spoke to Jesus about her. Verse 40, a man with leprosy came to Jesus, imploring him and kneeling down and saying, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him, and he said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed, and he sternly warned them, and immediately he went away. I mean, 10 times the word immediately. That's just in chapter 1. And it's, 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 it's just like, it's like Mark gives one little snapshot of Jesus' life and he moves to the next because he knew that's how the Romans, uh, that's how the Romans were wired, see. And he knew not being Jewish, they didn't care about Jesus' genealogy. They didn't care that he was related to Abraham, so he left that out. But he knew that the Romans would be very, very impressed in Jesus the servant, Jesus the doer, Jesus who got things done. And so you're not surprised that the key verse in Mark is Mark 10, verse 45, for even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, 
but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Then you get to Luke, altogether different from Matthew and Mark. Luke was a physician. Uh, he was raised in Macedonia. That means he was Greek. Um, and so he writes to the Greek. And being a physician, he was very interested from the perspective of Jesus as a man. In fact, his favorite reference to Jesus in his book is Jesus, the Son of Man. And he, being a doctor, gives us great details about the life of Jesus that the other gospels does. He says a lot about the birth of Jesus. He says a lot about the childhood of Jesus. We don't get that in any other gospels, but Luke came from that perspective. John comes along, and under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, he realizes that the picture of Jesus still isn't complete. We've seen Jesus as the Messiah. We've seen Jesus as the servant. We've seen Jesus as the son of man. But John knew that there needed to be a presentation of Jesus as the son of God. So he begins by John chapter 1 saying, in the beginning was the word who, if you were here last week, Mary pointed out, is a reference to Jesus. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And so John, he takes the opportunity to explain to us how Jesus came from God, was God on this earth, and he went back to God. Every account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all different, all God-breathed, all inspired. One gospel, four different perspectives. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21 says this, For prophecy never had its origin in the will, but prophets, through, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In other words, these, these writers, they were prompted. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And because of the Holy Spirit's inspiration, we can rest assured that the Bible we have is the word of God it's not man's opinion. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. If we really believe the Bible is the word of God, if our culture really believed the Bible is the word of God, a lot of these things that are getting debated in today's culture, we wouldn't have to debate. Because from the very beginning, God knew exactly what he was writing. And I'm telling you, we have the same Bible today. It doesn't change. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because culture changes doesn't mean the scripture changes. So this is God's word. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, well, Mike, it sounds good, um, but can you prove it? Can you prove it? Well, let's just take the area of prophecy concerning Jesus. Uh, we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Uh, we know that for 30 years, he had a job as a carpenter. We know at around the age of 30 that Jesus went public with his ministry. About three years into his ministry, uh, he caused so much uh, disruption and he was taking away the power of the religious leaders of the day. He was falsely accused. He was tried, eventually was crucified. Three days later, he rose again. But do you realize that when Jesus did those things, he fulfilled over 300, think about this, he fulfilled over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament. And these prophecies were written hundreds of years before they actually took place. For example, did you know that the very first Christmas was predicted by Isaiah the prophet 800 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem? By the way, I mentioned earlier that there is no ancient document of Plato, not one. Did you know that you can go to a museum in Jerusalem and you can see in its entirety the whole scroll of the book of Isaiah, an original ancient document that has been preserved for us? the entire scroll. It's an amazing thing to see. Isaiah wrote, not handle, <laughs> for unto us a son is born. Unto us a child is given. He wrote that in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Now to think that when he wrote that 800 years before Christmas, when he wrote those 14 words, he set into motion what we celebrate every year is Christmas. 800 years before it happened. That's just one of hundreds of prophecies that have been fulfilled. Peter Stoner it's one of my favorite illustrations. He's a scientist in the area of mathematical probabilities, uh, writes in this book, Science Speaks. He says, if we take just eight, just eight, eight of the 300 Old Testament prophecies concerning Christ, we will find that the probability of those eight coming to pass is 10 to the 17th power. Does that mean anything to anybody? No. So he goes on and he gives us this illustration. Listen to this. 
He says, if we take 10 to the 17th power of silver dollars and lay them on the face of Texas, they will cover all the state two feet deep. Now mark, one of these silver dollars, stir the whole mass thoroughly around and around and around, blindfold a man and tell him he must pick up one silver dollar. What chance would he have of getting the right one? just the same chance that the prophets would have had of writing these eight prophecies and having them come true in any one man. That's significant. And that's just eight. That's just eight prophecies. Jesus fulfilled hundreds of prophecies. So I want you to understand the Bible is reliable in its inspiration. Now, I want to close by asking you a question. What do you believe about the Bible? Because I will tell you, next week as we get into creation, creation, there are implications in your life with what you believe about the story of creation. It's going to determine how you view life. When you really determine what your perspective, is, your perspective and your view of how did God actually create? Or why did God do what he did in Genesis chapter 7? Or how could God pick Abraham, who was an idolater, to say, I'm going to bring through you the Messiah. you got to begin to come to terms that these have theological implications. What do you believe about the Bible? Because how you answer that question, I'm telling you, it will determine the trajectory of your life. You say, Mike, why is that? Well, Paul said this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He said, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? Every one of us, as we sit here today, there are things in our life that play out in our behavior because we've been taught certain things, and they've been lies. Sometimes we get them from our family. Sometimes we get them from religion. Sometimes we get them from the educational system. But we adopt these lies, and we begin to live our life based on these lies. They shape our thinking. They shape our behavior. And so for us to renew our minds, we have to replace those lies that have shaped how we've lived our life, and we have to replace them with the truth of God's word. And as I've said before, it's like refinishing a piece of furniture. You have to take off the old, and you have to put on the new. But to do that, you have to get into God's word, and you have to determine what lies have shaped how you live your life, and how does that line up with God's word? Because you may believe that this is okay, but over here the Bible says it's not okay. And are you going to take off that lie and are you going to accept the truth of God's word? You have to take off the old. You have to take off the new. And when you expose the lies and you replace them with the truth of God's word, you will be amazed at how your attitudes and behavior begin to change and how the attitudes and behaviors that have maybe bound you in the past, they begin to loosen their grip on your life. But that's only going to happen when you expose the lie. And that's why Jesus made the statement in John chapter 8, verse 32. Then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. But this is what's interesting. You got to know the truth. And so what we're going to do is we get into these overviews of the book of the Bible. We're going to look at some very controversial things. But we got to see what the truth is. And you may sit there and say, well, I'm not, that doesn't line up with how I think. Well, that's true. It may not. But are you willing to take off the lie and put on the truth of God's word? Because when you do that, I'm telling you, it's not about trying harder and harder so your life can change. It literally is about accepting the truth and letting God go to work in your life. Once you expose the lie and you believe the truth, the Bible will begin to set you free. So next week, we'll get into the book of Genesis. And uh, we're going to cover 50 chapters in about 35 minutes. <laughs> so be ready to go. But there's a lot in there. There's a lot in there we're going to see next week.